Hi, I'm Tyler Foltz. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. If you like this video, please give me a like down below. And go ahead and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you didn't like this video, please let me know down in the comments as far as what I can do better. I'm always looking to improve. Today we're going to be looking at a video by Kyle Hill, who I've never watched before, called We Solved Nuclear Waste Decades Ago. I'll give you the short version right now. 95% of waste is recyclable. Actually, I think it's over 95%. And the high-level waste, which is uh, transuranic, so uranium and elements that are higher than that, that is stored on site in a dry cask storage um, at the nuclear power plant and it is super safe in a super sealed container that can be there for many many years um, licenses are on the order of 100 years and can be stored indefinitely as far as i'm concerned let's see what kyle has to say of television shows movies and video games into thinking that nuclear waste looks like this. Those barrels. Yellow <laughs> barrels of bubbling, glowing green goo just ready to be toxic and transformative and spill like into a nearby river and make giant insects and stuff. <gasps> but like how commercials think that people actually sit in jackets and jeans in their own home, this depiction of nuclear waste <laughs> couldn't be further from the truth. The reality of the situation is one of entirely plausible and safe management, nearly indestructible storage and solutions that we've known about for literally decades. Today, let's see if we can't set the record straight, shall we? Kevin, clean up all this goo. I don't know what it is. Wear some gloves. Now entering the facility. According hmm. to basically any poll you'd like to look at on the subject, most people view nuclear waste and its disposal. Is this supposed to be some type of advanced nuclear facility or something? Man, it looks way cooler than any control room I've ever worked in. <laughs> as a fundamental obstacle for the expansion of nuclear power. Many of you may imagine a disaster like Chernobyl, which is now unfortunately ongoing, when I mention nuclear waste. But this is the image in your head that I want to challenge on today's program. It is my contention that- You said Chernobyl was ongoing. I mean, the sarcophagus does require active maintenance. Maybe that's what he's getting at, but it's been mitigated as, as about as much as you can get. Hmm. Nuclear waste is nowhere near the problem you think it is. And this misconception is leading to both improper management of nuclear waste and it's inhibiting the expansion of nuclear power, which you, of course you know I'm for. So just so right. you don't think I'm in the pocket of big uranium here, today I will start from the ground up, point A to point B, give you all the facts and eventually lead you through my reasoning. If at the end of today's episode you don't agree with me, that's fine, at least I think you have all the facts, which I ran by industry professionals before filming this video. So cool. we begin. What is nuclear waste? Nuclear waste, or radioactive waste more generally, is any waste that emits alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. It can be anything from spent nuclear fuel rods down to the gloves that nuclear engineers wear. And it comes from nuclear medicine, nuclear power production, and the reprocessing of nuclear weapons, as well as rare earth mining. To date, almost half a million tons of nuclear waste has been generated, though a third of that has been recycled. Instead of going to a dump or... Okay, he's including low and medium level stuff in this, in this calculation. The high level by volume, I think, is like 1% of that, something like that. Some large single area, because of public skepticism, nuclear waste is almost always either stored where it is generated on site, in pools of water, or in... The green dot at the bottom of Texas uh, is the nuclear plant that I used to work at. Um, there is dry cast storage in place. This might be a little outdated, but so dry cast storage is continuing to expand. I'm not sure what the date on this graph is, but I just thought I'd point that out that it is expanding more. On site, in pools of water or in so-called dry casks above the ground, which we'll get to. Yeah, I called oh. you big uranium because it sounded cool. Make the check out to Kyle Hill, H-I-L. 
Sorry, I was just subscribing to some magazines. Now, with thousands of tons of nuclear waste accumulating at sites all around the world, you may expect me now to start listing off all of the known environmental and health effects from nuclear waste. And that's what makes the public so skeptical, right? Well, I can't. Properly managed nuclear waste has no currently known widespread environmental or public health effects. This isn't barrels and barrels of glowing... I look too, and a lot of stuff you find out there, there's, a, there's some sensational articles out there about dumping waste into while water supplies, and they're half truths, it's not even anything. Some waste can be stored on site and has a low enough half-life that it decays away fully, and then it is discharged once there's no more nuclear waste or the radioactivity is at or below background levels. So, yeah, he's, he's right about that. Green goo just waiting to poison your river. No, this is reconstituted nuclear material in ceramic and glass and encased in many kilograms of concrete and steel forever. Sounds like the world is more affected by the waste generated on TikTok. <laughs> That's right, Arya. Does anyone know how to not dance like they're at a theater kid's boring wedding? <laughs> Sheesh! What the world seems to have forgotten about, or is just straight up ignoring, is that the non-nuclear waste we are producing right now, every second, is so, so much worse. It's literally killing us right now. Most of the world uses fossil fuels, right? Well, let's do the same comparisons that we just did on this program how much fossil fuel waste is produced. Well, every year in the US alone, coal plants put more ash into the sky by weight than 300 times. I think I know what he's getting at in this. So coal plants and other like, there's so much nasty stuff in coals and in the mining. There's actually more radioactive waste from those because of all the stuff you see in the ground from the dirt, the coal, all of that that's naturally occurring. You got radon, you got all kinds of random stuff, but it's not monitored at all. Um, nuclear plants operate in what is a radiological controlled area where health physics technicians, uh, radiation protection, subject matter experts uh, monitor all the uh, all of the amounts of radioisotopes that are in the area, including um, naturally occurring ones. For instance, um, tritium exists in nature at a very low concentration, but we actually keep tritium on site at nuclear plants till they actually get below background levels. So in a way, we're protecting the environment from the environment, which is fascinating but yeah coal other industries they just don't monitor it all of the nuclear waste ever produced in every single way ever that happens every year do the math and an average coal plant in the u.s will put more ash into the air and the Talking atmosphere ash. every hour than a single nuclear plant will in its entire lifetime Nuclear doesn't Where advantage. does all this fossil Period. fuel waste go? Well, look around. The trees, the topsoil, the atmosphere, your lungs. How does it affect people? One in five deaths can be attributed to the burning of inefficient fuels like gasoline and coal. And finally, have there been any large scale health and environmental effects from proper management of fossil fuel waste? Well, yeah. Yeah. Everyone always goes after deep water horizon. <laughs> <laughs> this hurts to look at because it's hurting the world. And yet we still maintain this tremendous blind spot for things like this. You remember this happening, right? It's true that radioactivity can be dangerous in a different kind of way, but even here, if you look into the numbers, just by nature of how coal is processed, 
it contains some amount of radioactive material. It comes from the ground just like everything else. And the average coal plant through its ash will put more radiation into the atmosphere than a hundred times what a nuclear plant of the same size would. That. Look, I'm no expert here. I'm no scientist, but I think about radiation a lot. I do my research. I've been to... I'm the expert on nuclear, and yeah, he's right about uh, coal. Like I said, they just don't monitor it. Chernobyl myself. And I can tell you that I'd rather spend a week in Chernobyl, maybe not right now, than say a week yeah. in Beijing, when the air quality is literally so bad, it's worse than what the first responders at Ground Zero on 9-11 were breathing. Remember, this isn't worst case versus worst case. This is not Chernobyl versus Exxon. This is complicated reality versus complicated reality. And right now, the reality is that fossil fuel is the invisible scourge that people... He's right, you can't look at worst case versus worst case, you can multiply that times probability to get what your real risk is. And the probability for something like Chernobyl ever happening again is so minuscule. In fact, that exact scenario can't happen again because that design and those operating margins will not let you operate, operate that way again. It'd be a bit like asking uh, gravity to fail. Imagine nuclear waste to be. But Administrator, if nuclear waste isn't as bad as fossil fuel pollution and the problem is already solved, what is the solution? Ah, yes. The whole point of this episode. And, uh, Arya, get big uranium back on the phone. I could use a new Lamborghini. Magazine subscription. <laughs> Nothing I've said so far actually demonstrates that nuclear waste isn't dangerous, just that it's less harmful than other forms of waste. So let's talk about... Okay, he's got a dome. I don't recognize the site, but I do buy that that's a nuclear plant. One misconception a lot of people get are those hyperbolic cooling towers you see um, on the right of that screen are automatically associated with nuclear. Um, the nuclear plant I worked at didn't actually have those. Um, it had a massive uh, cooling reservoir of almost 100,000 acres. But, and they also exist for uh, coal plants, fossil plants, and what's coming out of those cooling towers is just water. How nuclear waste is actually Same. managed. Out of a nuclear power plant like the one behind me, there are three kinds of waste that can be produced. Low level waste, which can be anything from papers to gloves that are lightly irradiated. Intermediate level waste that does require some shielding but decays well enough over time. And high level waste. This is the stuff that people worry about. A lot of low level waste can be done by as simple as doing laundry. Intermediate level is what I was talking about earlier with shielding and just letting it decay over time. And the high level stuff is what I was talking about with the, uh, with the dry cast storage. Stuff that needs to be cooled down in cooling ponds for a couple of years before being stored away. Now, even though this is the stuff people really worry about, it's only a tiny, tiny fraction of all the nuclear waste produced. In fact, all of the high level waste ever created by every nuclear power plant in the world could be buried in just a football field size space. Yeah, nuclear power is just that efficient. Now, as we said, high level waste is stored mostly above ground in so-called dry casks, giant concrete cylinders that can weigh as much as the world's heaviest door and inside of them is not green goo like you imagine. He's talking on the order of 100 to 200 tons. No, it's glass and ceramic. Nuclear material melted down combined with glass and ceramic and inert material such that the nuclear stuff stays cool and stays below critical. Despite a blue whale's worth of concrete, despite the known physics of shielding, the public still isn't comfortable with these casks. The San Onofre nuclear generating station found this out when they started transferring high-level waste to a... Those things are so safe and indestructible, they can withstand direct hits with missiles, and they keep stuff warm, and it can theoretically last thousands of years, so just give me a couple of pipes and a heat exchanger, you can make a nice hot tub out of one of those and you're never gonna have to pay for the heating.
<laughs> of ground casks near a beach, and the people there are still protesting that, imagining that this will... The Nuclear Regulatory Mesh, uh, Commission doesn't actually let you do that, though. ...problem for millennia. However, what they may not realize is that the vast majority, over 95% of all nuclear waste, has a short enough half-life that it can decay on site to the point of harmlessness in the lifetime of a power plant. Some longer-lived materials will have to be stored away forever, of course, but most of it will decay in the lifetime of a plant to inert rock and glass. At that point, standing next to one of these gargantuan nuclear coffins will literally be less harmful than taking a cross-country flight. Contrast this with fossil fuels again. Coal plants, for example... He's referring to radiation you get just by being up in the stratosphere. You get more, you get more radiation from cosmic rays than that than standing next to one of those things. It's 100% true. In fact, you even get more, a lot of people that work at nuclear plants that don't even walk by, that don't go out into some of the more, the hotter parts of the place, they get less dose than people on a commercial flight are the single largest source of mercury pollution on Earth. And neurotoxic metals like this will never, ever lose their toxicity, ever. They will always be a problem, and today, they're not even contained. Administrator, your request for the new Lamborghini Aventador has been denied by Big Uranium. Oh, come on, how many sensible facts do I have to shill for a sick Lambie? When properly stored and managed, nuclear waste is just so much easier to deal with than anything that comes out of fossil fuel use and production. But what about in between nuclear waste production and storage? Couldn't some accident happen when moving nuclear waste around? That's a good question, Aria. I want to show you something. These are nuclear waste transport casks. These are what we use to put nuclear waste in and move it from site A to site B or what have you. Now, for all intents and purposes, these are indestructible. Like, Hulk level, infinity gauntlet level, indestructible. Watch this for a second. Don't like that he used the word Hulk because that implies you get a radiator. <laughs> but I, I know where, what he was going with. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a train. You can there throw a runaway train at one of these things and nothing happens. In the millions and millions of miles, these things have... I've actually never seen that. There's more energy behind that than a typical missile travel across the globe for decades, there have been zero recorded accidents where one cracks open and stuff leaks out. Oh, There's yeah. nothing to leak. Remember, this is not green glowing goo. This is concrete and steel and glass and ceramic. And because of that, and because these things are so indestructible, it's very unlikely any of this is ever going to get weaponized like people are worried about. That's just not how these materials are going to work. What people should be worried about, something like a rogue piece of medical equipment somewhere, as unfortunately the entire city of Goiânia, Brazil, found out a few decades ago. When properly stored and managed, nuclear waste might in fact be the safest waste there is. And all of this is even without the ultimate solution for all of this stuff that nuclear scientists and engineers have known about for decades. So with that, it's time to go underground. Oh, my thoughts. The international scientific consensus is that the best option for long-term storage of high-level nuclear waste is deep geological disposal. It sounds simple, and that's because it is. You dig a big hole that... So this was attempted in the past with Yucca Mountain in the United States, but... It's just this classic not in my backyard mentality. No one who lives near there um, wants it. Just like no one wants a nuclear plant or a coal plant or wind turbines or anything like that. So it's hard to just get people who, to agree on this sort of thing. But it's, it's absolutely safe and a good repository that could probably withstand, I forget the exact numbers for Yucca Mountain, but it would be able to withstand every plant in the US, ship all their waste there, it could last us for thousands of years, assuming we never shut those plants down and continue to expand our nuclear industry. It goes really far underground, you put the already safe dry casks in there. You dig the hole so deep that it's 
below anything that's a water table, geologically active, yep. or a biosphere. It's as isolated as you can get from humanity without literally throwing these things into space, which you can't do. And we know <laughs> that this deep disposal would work because billions of years ago, nature already tried it. About two billion years ago, in what is now Gabon, Africa, a rich natural uranium deposit moderated by intruding groundwater kicked off a series of modestly powerful nuclear reactions. Oh, he's talking about that, the natural uh, power plant, if you will, that just from a natural run runoff. What are the odds of that? That is just something that's always been fascinating, that it had enough to create a little bit of a self-sustaining reaction. <laughs> natural nuclear reactor right in the ground. Yeah. These reactions generated energy and heat for hundreds of thousands of years. And I'm telling you this little geological factoid because in all that time with... Keep in mind that when you put in dry cask, those are calculated such that it'll keep below criticality, which he mentioned earlier. And all that means is being able to start a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. That's what criticality means. It doesn't mean anything's gonna blow up. <laughs> and they are have a certain amount of subcriticality margins so that this sort of thing doesn't happen within each of the uh, dry task containers and also a, a, a heat profile margin to ensure uh, no, no overheating occurs based on how they're designed. Um, there's a very specific way in how you load these casts but as he's describing here and what I can tell he's going to allude to is even if you didn't do that, you're still safe because there's just that much safety margin. All of the movement of the underlying geology with all of the erosion, with zero protection, zero storage, the waste from this natural reactor, which was in contact with groundwater, moved less than 30 feet away from the site. Even without decades of study backing it up, even without a metric buttload of specialized concrete shielding, this natural experiment worked, and it's good evidence that deep disposal is relatively safe. If this is such a good solution, why aren't we doing it? Well, why don't we ask the experts? I thought you were an expert. Oh, no. No, no, I'm just an expert at this. To make sure I got the facts in this program right, I spoke with the scientists and engineers over at Deep Isolation, the world's first private company to make advancements in a very promising twist on deep geological disposal. Now, instead of wanting to use giant mines underground that are 18 feet wide, and need people and heavy machinery, and you have to move casks around with humans, instead of that, they want to use borehole technology that the oil and gas industry already has. Okay. Instead of those giant mines, you just need drill 18-inch diameter holes, a thousand feet or more into the ground. You drill it at an angle or horizontal or vertical, but you drill it all the way below aquifers, below anything that's geologically active, below more rock than is in a generic disaster film. Into these holes, you put nuclear casts, you stack them or you line them up, you fill the entire thing with concrete, you seal it, you forget about it. The great thing about this... There are more than 18 inches across, though. Yet, even at a picture earlier, you saw a person for scale. They're on the order of five meters across. idea is that you can do this all on site at a nuclear power plant. Deep isolation estimates that it would take just 20 of these size holes, you can find the space somewhere for that, to contain an entire nuclear power plant's lifetime's worth of nuclear waste, which means... Maybe he's talking about having them in, like each fuel assembly, but even fuel assemblies are more than, I don't know, eight. Unless you said something different, 18 inches doesn't sound right. No single large repository somewhere. No single national site where taxpayers would have to pay for it and accept it. Not accepting it Yucca is Mountain. exactly why a project like the Yucca Mountain Repository yeah. died. According to Deep Isolation, geologic disposal is robust enough to survive earthquakes, ruptured canisters, and broken seals. This is simply a benefit of just being so deep underground. 
funding exists right now to try something like this. And deep isolation has done its own polling to suggest that most of you would be much more comfortable knowing that a million year solution like this was up and running. Look, I again, I'd be comfortable using them as heaters for people's hot tubs. <laughs> partially making this video because yes, I am pro-nuclear power, but I'm mainly making it because this is a perceived, imagined problem that has an easy solution that's staring us right in the face. We have the fun. Thank you for saying that. There is a huge difference between perceived risk and actual risk associated with nuclear. Another example is people are more afraid of dying in an airliner crash than they are in a car wreck, even though I think you're about a thousand times more likely to die in a car wreck. We have proven technologies. Like we have scientific consensus. The thing that's holding us back from storing all the nuclear waste in the world right now is you. Public acceptance. Not me. <laughs> Whether or not we store waste in a more safe safe and manageable way, whether or not we do that and then expand nuclear power and then use nuclear power to help fight climate change, that is all up to you. I believe I've given you an accurate portrayal of this landscape, whether or not it changes your mind. I did all I could as your resident science boy. Until next time, I gotta go fuel up my Lamborghini Honda Civic. <laughs> I like him. That was my first time uh, watching um, any of his videos, and I could tell it was well it was well thought out. Um, and he definitely did consult some experts. Only thing I'm skeptical about is the whole that whole 18 inch borehole thing. But that that's a bit of an out there sort of uh, project. But even if that project doesn't get undertaken at all, it's still safe um, at the site that I worked at. It was were licensed to have um, a whole bunch of dry casts, basically enough for however much fuel, 30 years of operation worth, um, or excuse me, um, it would be 40 plus years of operations by the time, uh, by the time it's all um, placed out on the pad. And you're, it's licensed for 100 years and you could extend it indefinitely on the surface. Highly resistant to tornadoes, hurricanes, anything so you can rest pretty easy about nuclear waste uh, that was a pretty good video um, let me know if you want me to check out more of his content in the future thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time